welcome to the Smart Connector podcast, which looks at the power of connection in business and life. Featuring solo episodes as well as a range of exciting interviews with entrepreneurs across multiple sectors, we offer tips and advice to build your impact, wealth and success, attract others for all the right reasons and become a Smart Connector, the architect of your amazing business and life. Welcome to the Smart Connector podcast. As ever, I have a fantastic guest for you today, and it's John Ball. Welcome, John. Hi, Jane. Thanks for inviting me. You're very welcome. It's great to have you here. So John is a former flight attendant who is now a persuasive podcast presentation coach, an online course trainer and an international speaker on topics like podcasting for business growth and thought leadership, ethical persuasion skills and developing charisma, which is his primary focus right now. And he helps people perfect their podcast presentation skills. So we're going to get into that quite a lot because Of course, as everybody knows, I am a massive fan of the medium of podcasting. So I'm always looking for those those tips and those hacks and so on to make my podcast more successful and also to help my audience if they're thinking or perhaps already active in the podcast space. So so anyway, great to have you here. So, John, let's get into it. So we were chatting beforehand about mm-hmm. your podcast because you have a podcast as well, don't you? So mm-hmm. let's start there and tell tell our audience about your podcast. My podcast has been through a few different iterations, but it is yeah. now called Podfluence. Mm-hmm. And Podfluence is really all about developing online influence, growing audience and influence and income as well, primarily targeting towards business coaches who are looking to to grow their business in a way that builds relationship, is long-term focused and creates more of a a machine of lead generation than anything else. And I recognize that there's a huge opportunity for business coaches, not just in having their own podcast, which is a great thing to do, but also to be going on podcast as guests and getting themselves in front of of potentially far more people than they ever could otherwise. Yeah. And, you know, this is, of course, you know, this is a fascinating topic of conversation for me because I'm often approached by people who don't have their own podcasts asking to be on my podcast. And sometimes I say, well, if they're a really interesting entrepreneur, you know, maybe their focus isn't podcasting. It's absolutely fine. And, you know, I'd love to interview you. But I must say that actually having a podcast yourself, I think, is a kind of badge that I think other podcasters really respect. If you've actually put in the time, the commitment, the effort and, of course, the investment to actually, you know, build a proper podcast, which, yeah, I mean, your podcast has got how many episodes it's, it's coming up to its 160th episode. Uh, 100, this week. Yeah, 160 episodes. And I've got 175. So, you know, by the time you get to that point, you're serious, you're professional, and you've made a significant investment. And I For think sure. it really does make a difference personally if you want to go on other people's shows and so on. I think it makes a a big difference to the way that they perceive you. And so I'd just like to start there. Do you agree with that or do you think it doesn't really matter? I'm going to say yes and no. uh, Because I think all it really tells you is that they are certainly committed to what they're doing, but they're going to have the setup that means you're not going to be having rubbish audio if you have them on your show. Mm -hmm. And they they probably have a bit more of a clue what they're doing than a lot of other people might do. But I, I, don't necessarily think that it guarantees a good guest you would have to still check out their show and and their style because there's a lot of bad podcasts out there and you know some people it's very subjective I know some people might listen to my show and think (laughs) it's not a good podcast because it's not going to be for everyone but I don't want it to be but in terms of thinking about who do I want on my show as a guest I don't really care if my guests have a podcast or not, but it is nice if, if it's especially if it's one that matches up and you can go on each other's shows. And in terms of 
network building. It can be more expensive to have your own podcast. So I think it's very beneficial for individuals to have that. But to me, it's not an, it's not something I consider it other than you're going to have good recording equipment for being a guest on my show. Far more important to me is to hear somebody being interviewed on another podcast because I don't want anybody popping their podcast cherry on my show. I want to know they have some experience and that they know a bit what they're doing and that it's not going to be me having to break them into the world of podcast interviewing. Yeah, and I think that's a very, very important point. And, and I think when I've selected guests for my podcast, I tend to go for people who have a very specific expertise and point of view, and they've got something to a really good story, perhaps, or a really good skill set, let's just say, to share with the world. But what I have found is that, as you said, some people who you know, they're going on a lot of podcasts, they've got the professional setup, they've got a good microphone. Obviously, we all know that audio matters in podcasting. And other people, I have interviewed people who have, you know, they have no microphone. And sometimes they may be talking, you know, directly, just maybe using some headphones that they use for their phone or whatever. And it really does make a difference I think to the quality of the experience for the listeners because audio is really it's that the heart of good podcasting isn't it apart from obviously quality content I would say so yeah I, I, you can forgive a certain amount in podcasting but realistically do you want to listen to a show that has bad audio quality like if you're if you are listening to the radio if people still do that in the car i do but i don't know how many people still do but if you're listening to the radio and you start going out of a signal area and it starts getting all fuzzy and crackly are you going to keep listening or are you going to try and tune it in or maybe if you can't get a better signal you probably find something with a clearer channel the same happens in podcasting. It's really important to, to be clear and to be understandable and not to have those, those noise interruptions. If you think about it in this sense, people who listen to podcasts are quite drawn to the audio format anyway. Yeah. And that often means that they are quite, you know, quite high in audit, auditory. They, they like audio stuff. They often will have that as a preferred method of, of yeah. gathering information. And they're probably also more likely to be sensitive to bad audio and the distortions or you know, all sorts of stuff that can crop up with that. So it is important in an audio format, especially for people who like audio, to make sure you give them as good an experience as possible. Yeah, I think I think you're absolutely right there. And, you know, when I think about myself, I mean, I'm a big fan of listening to podcasts as well. And I always try and listen to at least one podcast a day. And I often do it in the car or I might do it when I'm walking the dog. But when I'm not listening to podcasts, I'm usually listening to music. And it's just because, as you said, I'm a very auditory person, I'm a very auditory person, but also a visual person. But auditory, I find it much easier to process information that is delivered in that format. Yeah. So when audiobooks came out, for example, I realized that I struggled to read some business books, even, you know, in, on my preferred Kindle. But when I actually listened to them, I just found that the experience was completely different and the information went in. Yeah. So, yeah. I'm with I, you there, Jane. I'm with you there. I, I really, love all. I love audiobooks and when that format started getting bigger and it's still growing very rapidly that was exciting to me because it became a way to get a lot more information I still love reading books but I get through much more content and ideas generated and a deeper level learning sometimes from audiobooks in fact one of the things I love most and it doesn't really relate so much to, to the, what our topic for the show but one of the things I love most is what what kindle and audible have which is the whisper sync stuff when you can listen and follow along with the book i just find that that is a deep level of learning for me personally and i think a lot of other people have had good experience with that too yeah yeah well that's a kind of multi-sensory thing isn't it and i think sure. you know since we're on the topic i mean i have to say that i am not like a huge fan of video learning for example i mean i have my own online course and i know that you have an online course as well and obviously i created videos for that and i used a professional videographer i made the videos as 
beautiful as I possibly could because that matters to me and, you know, recorded them all professionally so the audio was good and they were really nicely edited and so on. So that's great. But I personally find I get sensory overload when mm. I'm trying to learn through a video format. I just can't do it. Well, not for very long. You know, I have to kind of take a break because, you know, we're all made up differently, aren't we? And we all process in different ways. Uh, it's such an interesting topic, isn't it? Because we, some we people, all have our preferences. Yeah. yeah, we all have our preferences. But yeah. well, one thing I one thing I dislike that I think the personal development industry has kind of exacerbated a bit is this idea that we're only auditory or we're only visual <laughs> so, mm. so people say oh i can't listen to a podcast i'm a visual learner and like that's rubbish you, you you still listen to stuff it's just your preference is to read or to see stuff it, so you know, sometimes people will just completely wipe something as that oh no i'm not going to watch your video because i'm an auditory learner it's like well you, you might struggle a bit more with it but you would be missing out potentially on a whole load of value if you say, I'm never going to watch videos because I just want to listen to stuff. It's, so that sort of stuff is crazy to me, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, the other thing is, of course, is that, you know, you can you can always have videos that you just listen to the audio on. And of course, exactly. you know, basically the world is your oyster these days in terms I of sensory so. processing, right? Yeah, and I think it's great if you can to provide stuff in multiple formats which yeah. is one one reason why in podcasting a lot of people what people will do a full transcript of their show as well yes as part of the content because there's going to be people who will prefer to read it rather than listen or watch it so, yeah. yeah definitely definitely yeah fascinating topic so what makes you so passionate about podcast john i mean what's what why have you decided to make this your business Mm. It, it's interesting you know we, we were talking before we started and i you were saying how it was kind of an, an experiment for you mine was a project mine was a project for toastmasters and so that's where i started the show and i enjoyed doing it so much that i wanted to keep doing it i did not recognize business potential with it i would just enjoyed doing the show I enjoyed having the conversations started getting people to come on as guests initially people in my network who I was already connected to and then started expanding from there I did all of the podcast mistakes because I had no clue what I was doing but I, <laughs> but I still enjoyed it and wanted to keep going like I started late 2019 and here we are in 2023 and my show is still going although last year I did have a, a a several months hiatus from the show which is the, the longest break I've ever had from it but I don't think I ever really want to start to ever want to stop podcasting because it's just become a a passion for me. And over that journey, I've been able to recognize the business potential that is there with it yeah. and and tie it in so much more with what I do professionally. So that has been an evolution of my show and me professionally as well. Yeah. And I think that's a very important point the evolution because it was very much the same for me obviously we were chatting beforehand so my podcast I launched it after yours but in the very same way I didn't really know what I was doing in the beginning I just thought though I saw I was saw people around me doing it and I thought this sounds like fun it sounds like something that I'd like to do too and and I think what happens in the beginning, and this is what we were talking about, is that you put in this huge amount of effort because obviously the learning curve is massive in the beginning. Yeah. Uh, there's so much to do. It's like, oh, intros, outros, you know, getting getting up on this on this platform, you know, should I edit it myself? Should I get an editor? How should I actually do this thing? And all the equipment, of course, the microphones, you know, which microphone, how do I, you know, should I go on YouTube as well and do right. it as a video as well as an audio? Or should I just do an all? I mean, that, that, you know, it's just endless. And then you put in all this effort and then you get maybe five or 10 <laughs> people actually consume right, yeah. yeah exactly and you're like what am i doing <laughs> but, but but and this is a big but for anybody that is thinking of starting a podcast is that now you know 175 episodes in and obviously almost as many for you i'm obviously in the top two and a half percent globally right now you know thousands of downloads a month 
And what you realize is that it, it with these kind of evergreen formats, if you like, is that you know, you become more valuable, your podcast becomes more valuable when you've got this evergreen wall of content. And I've heard it described as that, that yeah. people can just, when they land on an episode, they think, you know, that's kind of quite interesting. I like that. And then they go back and they start to consume previous episodes. And that's how the whole thing snowballs. And it really does snowball. And, you know, the quality of the guests that I have coming on are just phenomenal now and I'm not having to really reach out to anybody they come to me I mean I still do obviously like to retain editorial control and and reach out to people if I think they're interesting but it's very very heartwarming let's just say the way that it does develop so yeah, yeah. obviously I'm a great fan <laughs> yes similarly to yourself I, I get a pro in fact just today I had a an email or, or, or a site a web, through my website, actually, a contact through my website of somebody who wants to be on my show. And I'm looking at it thinking, oh, I know who that person is. I've listened to their podcast. I, I, yeah. I know who they are. I think, well, that's great. It's nice to be at that stage. Of course, you know, any pod, anyone who has a podcast also knows you get all these agencies that come with all sorts of people who are completely irrelevant to what you talk about and, and you probably have no interest in having on your show. That happens too. But it, the, when you do get those people and when you can have, when you have a reason to connect with people who you might never otherwise have a reason to talk to, mm. or, that's really powerful too. So in terms yeah. of network building, I think if that was the only reason you did a podcast, it would still probably be worthwhile. Um, you still have to have some value, of course. It can't just be uh, talking about any old stuff. And and people do start podcasts that just talk about anything and everything. But if you're going to do something with value, you can start to invite on your business heroes, your people who you look up to and respect. Mm. And I think pretty much any podcaster who I've ever spoken to who's doing this seriously has said that has been one of the best things about starting a podcast is the the network that you build up, people you would have heard of, people you wouldn't have heard of as well. And that becomes very powerful for you in your future, who you can connect to, who you can then go to and say, hey, look, I've had some of your peers on my show. Maybe you would like to come on as well. Definitely. And I think it's not just the power of the network as well. It's also the quality of their thinking, because yeah. everybody is very flattered to be invited onto a podcast. They're usually very grateful for the opportunity to have a, you know, no holes barred chat about what they do and about their journey and so on. And I think that really sets up a very, very nice dynamic as well, because right from the beginning, you're not selling to them. They're not selling to you. You're kind of there as as peers. And, you know, I just love that because it means that you can have a really nice, relaxed chat. You can pick their brains for free, obviously, yeah. ask all the questions that you would what you would have wanted to ask them had you met them in, and say, a closed meeting but also you're doing it on behalf of your guests. And right. I think that is, again, a really, really lovely thing because we have the opportunity as podcasters to, you know, make a real difference to people who, you know, they might not be able to afford or, you know, in any way engage with the caliber, certainly of the guests that I've had on. So, I just love that. I feel as though there's a very much a philanthropic element to it as well. I, I agree. I, although I would say my, my experience is that my biggest shows have generally been with people that most people would never have heard of, like my most downloaded episodes. Oh, really? It, it, for the majority of the case for me, it's been about what we talk about. Uh -huh. than, than who I'm talking with. Like sometimes a big name will give you a spike, but in the longer term downloads, my experience has been that it's the subjects. So having uh -huh. really good episode titles that are compelling is okay. really, really important. And uh, but one but one thing I, I do particularly like about podcasting, which is why I think more people, should, more people should be doing it at least as a guest, if not having their own show as well, is that it, like you said, it gives you that evergreen sort of, 
opportunity for content that people will keep coming back to again and again but it also gives you the opportunity to have those longer form conversations with your potential future ideal clients the people who you'd most like to work with Uh, yes even if you had i don't know 10 20 people listening to your podcast for most people if you were offered to give a talk to 10 or 20 people who were in your ideal target market it would probably still be worthwhile. And yet a lot of people seem to think, well, if it was a podcast, it needs to be hundreds. It really doesn't. You can pick up business from somebody with the smallest audience if their audience is if their audience is engaged and relevant and, and specifically targeted. If it's just their friends and family listening, it's a different story. But if they've been going a while and, and they have maybe a, a small but niche audience, there's still a huge value in that for you. And it's one of the reasons why I don't focus too much on the vanity <laughs> metrics of, of the show, because yeah. I really just want to make sure that I'm providing value and connecting with the people who I most want to help, which may not get me up to sort of the top levels of podcasting because I have a niche that I focus on serving. Yeah, a very, very important point. And uh, also the other thing is that it can also be a wonderful tool for clients as well, for existing clients, because I know that my some of my clients have really appreciated it when I have invited them on my show, because it then gives them a tool to take to their audiences. And you know, it's wonderful to actually be interviewed by somebody because it gives you the opportunity to blow your own trumpet, as it were, and actually talk about what it is that you do really well without necessarily feeling, having to feel as though you're just standing there on your soapbox and just telling everybody how wonderful you are, right? Yeah. And I think there are some key reasons. I'm always surprised when I come across people who don't do this at all even as guests. And a lot of the reasons are the same reasons why they might not do public speaking. Some of it's like a bit of shyness, a bit of introversion, and don't really want to get up there on a platform in in front of people. But just as with things like the public speaking, going on podcasting, you're not going to be brilliant the the first time you go on a podcast. Unless you're already very experienced in being interviewed, you're not going to be brilliant. So you have to be ready for that you might actually suck a bit and that's okay because you will get better you have to put in the reps like nobody goes to goes to the gym and walks out with a six pack if they didn't go in there with it you know so it's a slow build that that comes over time and so you you have to accept that you're still gonna look and feel and sound the same afterwards but you will be in a small percentage better and then the next one you do you'll be a small percentage better oh yeah and and you will keep getting better and you will make mistakes you will mess stuff up i can think of a number of times especially early on in podcasting where i had to ask for an episode to be re-recorded because i messed up so badly and these things will happen more than likely so be ready for that and but accept it and know that it's still worth it anyway because i think the alternatives these days are If you're looking for this as a business growth thing, spending a fortune on paid ads, which is getting more competitive and more expensive for less for less results, doing all these crazy TikTok trends and trying to create tons of social media on all of the channels, which a lot of people are trying to do, and finding themselves heading for content creation burnout. And or they just end up like coaching, end up working for coaching companies that will pay them an hourly, which is far less than they really deserve or could be earning if they just knew how to make stuff work for themselves. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's a very, very important point. And the thing is, you know, anybody who is running their own service based business, a coach, consultant, a speaker, but also professional service providers. I mean, I have a lot of professional service providers in my program who they may be, you know, mortgage brokers or, you know, independent financial advisors or tech, you know, people or whatever, but they actually provide a service to other people. And of course, that's a very crowded and competitive space as well, because essentially they're all selling the same products. And so their personal brand and how they 
project themselves, it can't be just them talking about their products the whole time because they would just bore people rigid. Yeah. People in that kind of environment, people choose people because of the relationship that they have with them and the promise of that relationship. So all of these all of these opportunities, obviously social media and, you know, I mean, everything really, YouTube and, and websites and everything, you know, it's a chance to obviously, you know, put our personal brands out there. But I really don't think that there is any opportunity in my yeah. book that is more powerful than podcasting. I just don't think that. Yeah, I agree. And you think how how intimate the experience is to some degree as well, because mm -hmm. as you say, it's like li listening in the car, probably listening by yourself, right? I mean, yeah. because you want to listen to the stuff that you want to listen yeah. to. If you've got the kids in the car or something like that, you're, you're probably not going to put on a business podcast because you need to keep everybody happy. Yeah. But, but people are listening whilst they're on walks, whilst they're in the gym. They've got their yeah. ear pods in their ears and they're listening to your voice going directly into their eardrums. Yeah. That is a very personal and intimate experience. Yeah, exactly. And I think the lovely thing about it, it's a bit like eavesdropping, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it's a bit like kind of just listening in on somebody else's conversation and just being part of it, really, you, you feel as though you're part of the experience and you're part of the conversation and that you do actually feel as though you know them after a while, which I think right. is a really lovely thing. I think that's super important. And and I've always, I've always looked at it in the sense of you, I do want my podcast to be like that conversation that you overhear that you that you want to keep listening into yeah, uh, because it's interesting and, and it's valuable. And so it's one thing that, yeah, there is a, a, a bit of interest in sometimes in just overhearing people's conversations, but even more so if you re if it's really interesting and that, oh no, I need to hear more of this conversation. That's ideally what, what I want to go for on my style of show. And, and it sounds like you know, similarly for yourself as well. I think that's the, the best kind of thing. You, you want people to be, wanting to hear what's coming next in the conversation and a lot of people forget this which is one of the reasons why i'm doing a lot of what i'm doing yeah. is that podcasts like like outcome-based podcasts that are like informational and often professionally related often miss out on a important chunk of podcasting is like they have the information bit but a lot of them miss out on the entertainment bit yeah and and podcasting needs to be entertaining. If people yes. are going to listen to it, dry, boring conversations are no no good for anyone. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And the thing is, I come from a media and entertainment background. So I basically, I grew up with entertainment. I grew up with, look, keep your mouth shut if you can't say anything that's entertaining because, right. you know, that's the space that we're in. Yeah. If you think about it, you know, I come from the, you know, Simon Cowell school of, <laughs> hard knocks let's just say so right. you know that 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 tv and entertainment you know mentality is is drummed into you very early yeah. and you know this is media you know this is not you know just a closed conversation about you know some boring business topic you right. we are here in order to provide entertainment yes we are so the more that we can talk in a let's just say a no holds barred interesting way then the more we are going to get those followers and get those subscribers and people are going to keep coming back for more aren't they exactly that and this is not to say that you need to be like michael mcintyre or uh, you know uh, hey, it helps. Or whoever. <laughs> yeah i mean i, I guess if, if you like their style of doing things yeah. but it has to be your style Mm. And it has, it has to be you. So, you know, you don't have to become a stand-up comedian doing your set. Yeah. If you can add humor in, it's going to help a lot. Same as yeah. it would for becoming a public speaker. If you can't, if, if you can only be serious and kind of one level of emotion and energy the whole time, that's going to lose people. So, so there, does, there does have to be changes of energy, sometimes some changes of pace vocal variety which you'll often hear public speakers talk about it needs to be there in podcasting as well and to some degree 
stories as well. Our stories are probably the most powerful thing that you can bring with you as a podcast guest. So it doesn't matter if they're hilarious or not, or mildly amusing, or just just sort of that interesting stories Sad. that yeah. relate to, that relate to what you're talking about and are interesting for people to hear because that will make it entertaining for people that we want something to listen into something that's dramatic or had a twist at the end or mm. was an un unexpected surprise or it was hilarious or as you say it was very maybe it's very sad but so long as it's not something that you're going through at the moment yes <laughs> which, is, which is definitely something to be avoided so long as yeah. it's not something you're going through right now it's fine have have a story because ultimately it's our stories that people will buy again and again and again that's what people want to hear and so rather than people who will sort of think oh this is great i can go on a podcast and sell my stuff that won't work for you because you know people people skip through podcast commercials for a reason oh yeah <laughs> they don't too, generally yeah. want to hear them it's like no. we, we don't want a whole episode that's a commercial people won't listen to that but if you have stories, people will buy you. If they like you, they're going to want to know more about you and what you do and how you can help them. So having those stories that you can bring in is going to make you captivating. And it's probably one of the most critical things to bring with you to a podcast. Yeah, I think that's a really important point about it not being something that you're going through right now, right? Not not the kind of bleeding heart sort of, oh, my life is just it's just taking a turn for the worst and, <laughs> and and it only happened yesterday and you'll never guess what I know. People don't want to hear that because they're all going through that in their personal lives anyway. What people want, I think, is to be inspired. So they want to hear, God, my life was terrible. And now, you know, this is how I got through it. And that's inspiring, uplifting. It's like, thank God, you know, I this is going to be OK. You know, everything's going to yeah. be OK because exactly. if they made it, I will. Right. Exactly. But, you know, what? I mean, I, I think people are a bit cynical now about the common rags to riches stories that uh -huh. people have bought yeah, yeah. and and you, you probably know what I mean by that like I've been to enough personal development events over the years to yeah. to have heard the sim more or less the same story told by a bunch of people from the uh, stage yeah. and I think people are a bit cynical of that now it does need to be an authentic story it needs to be real and feel real and it's okay if you started from a poor background, that's that's fine. But so long as your story isn't someone else's story that you've adapted to have that, you don't need that. If you don't come from that background, give your authentic story. Because I think it's just as important that people know you can get success from whatever background. Like you mentioned about me being a, having been a flight attendant before. Mm -hmm. I don't think too many people imagine that flight attendants go on to open their own businesses and to start up as a business coach and a presentation skills coach or have their own podcast. I, I could be wrong, but I think most people imagine that that's not something that flight attendants generally do. Yeah. And so, so just knowing that it's like, well, you can come from any background. You might have worked in you might have worked in a supermarket, you might have worked as a hairdresser, you might have worked in, as a binman or a, a refuse collector. It doesn't matter what your background is, so long as it is your genuine story, people are going to be interested to hear that. Yeah, yeah. And there is this guy that I follow on YouTube called Mike Winnett. I don't know if you know. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know who he is. Entrepreneur, yeah. he's called. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, so, so he, he always he's just hilarious really and he always talks about what he calls the bullshit backstory yes. because there is a formula right that there's a Absolutely. formula for getting people to part with their with their money that some of the more unscrupulous gurus or whatever tend to tend to kind of do really they they just perform yeah. these certain kind of things yeah. that 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 let's just say more naive people you know they believe and they fall into right. so i think that's the bullshit backstory is probably what you're alluding to right yeah yeah and and people people are still using those strategies and to to a certain extent they 
are working, but people are becoming more sophisticated in the market. So that those things will be working less and less as people do become wise to them. And thanks to people like Mike, who are letting people know what those strategies are, I can remember being taught how to do exactly the kind of stuff that, Me too. Uh, that, Mike, that Mike talks about railing against. And so I think, well, it's no wonder people are being taught to do that. It's effective. They're not necessarily unethical people who are trying to do a con but often the people who are doing the best with this stuff are not as ethical as we might like to think that you're they are. right yes yes because you know i i also did that speaker training and you know the what i was told at the time is look you know the best thing to do is to bring you know bring people to tears that is really if you can cry yourself and if you can make them cry you've got them in the palm of your hand that is it, yeah. you know. So, so it's like okay, I had, <laughs> right. I, I had I had an epiphany some yeah. years ago, Jane, when I was. Uh, I, I used to be quite religious. I'm, I'm not at all now. I have to say, I, I'm completely the opposite of religious now. But uh, I I remember going to a religious event in the U.S. and I was staying with people from a, a church. I'm getting the whole story, but it was tied to the church that I was going to in the, in the UK as well. And we went to this big, I guess they'd call it a revival event in the U S but what I noticed at that event was that most of what was going on, there was emotional manipulation. Really? The, the, the stories were designed to raise up people's emotional state. The mm -hmm. music was all there to enhance those emotions. So it was all very, you know, like emotional strings rising up. And, and so it was all about creating that sort of, firstly, the sort of soft emotional state and then building that up, building that up, building that up. And I could see exactly what was happening and the results that that was getting for people. And to me, it just felt like emotional control. It was manipulation. And to me, even if it was done with the best of intentions, that wasn't what I considered to be ethical. And so that actually started a journey for me in understanding more how people think and are influenced by things and to helping people develop ethical influence and persuasion skills, which is a big part of what my training is about as well, yeah. that we want to be able to influence people, but we want to be able to do it in a way that isn't cynical, that is ethical, like from the heart, yeah. and not just trying to manipulate people into a certain response or emotional state. We still have to work with people's emotions. We are emotional beings, whether, whether we like it or not. And the rational side of us usually follows on from the emotional side of us rather than yeah. lead, leading the way. And so we still have to work with that, but we can do it in a way that isn't actually just about trying to manipulate people to get them where we want them to be, but actually is about creating appropriate emotional stories and connections and relationships in a way that isn't going to feel dirty or that if you found out what was going on, you wouldn't feel bad about it or that you'd been tricked or <laughs> anything like that. Do you get what I'm wearing? Oh yeah. From? I mean, I mean, definitely. I mean, obviously as a, as a brand marketer, you know, we were talking about my, my background, you know, working for, you know, big global brands. I mean, for decades, a couple of decades, really, obviously brand marketing is all about emotion and everybody knows that, you know, and the, the, the more, you know, the more a, a product, you know, relies on its brand, for example, you know, Coca-Cola or, you know, perfumes or, you know, flash cars and watches and all that kind of thing, you know, any any product that is very brand heavy, it is very important to have that emotional appeal and to really know how to work with people's emotions because people are aspirational and they're also fear driven, you know, the fear of missing out and all of those kind of things. And so all of that is very important. But I think the the thing that you are highlighting, which I totally agree with, is that that you can do this authentically by understanding your audience and really knowing what matters to them and yeah. then appealing to that in a very specific way. Or you can just do the kind of, you know, the sort of mallet over the head kind of, you know, I'm going to make you cry no matter what. And then you're going to feel 
sorry for me. And then because you feel sorry for me, you'll then want to do something for me, which is basically give me your money. <laughs> to, to, to a greater to a greater part and, and i said that one of the reasons why I'm, I'm kind of big on this is because there are so many things that can be done under conscious awareness mm. that will that will influence people music probably being the most powerful one yeah but, uh, but these things that are sometimes below conscious awareness like if you watched if you watch any film without music in it you are you don't have those automatic cues as to what emotional state you're supposed to be in so if you haven't got the staccato strings at a tense moment in a horror film you're not going to feel nearly the same level of suspense as you might do having that in the background and yet when it's there you probably won't even really notice that it's there it's just part of the experience and and there are so many things like that in in life that we just don't notice And, and again it's like we can argue about the sort of ethics of them my 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 view is this if you are working towards people's best potential outcome not just for your own personal gain and benefit then the ethics become less of an issue if you're from a heart-centered mission-led kind of place in your life where you're actually wanting to make people's lives better make the world better and then hopefully your decisions will will fall in line with that. And the questions of whether influence and persuasion is ethical then become le- less of a deal. But we still need to know what those things are so that we can access them in the ways that are going to make sense for us to be able to have the right amount of influence and persuasion, like charisma skills, right? I mean, it's something most people don't have, and, and a lot of people associate charisma with cult leaders. And those guys, like, those guys know how to, I didn't say, I mean, women cult leaders as well, and different, all different kinds of cults, but they know how to wrap people emotionally around their little fingers. They know how to keep, keep people under control, and they usually have a heck of a lot of charisma with it as well. Oh, yeah. And and so knowing how to be able to have that level of charisma that you're not going to use to try and get people to join your cult, but to actually get them to empower themselves learn good things and and develop their lives and improve improve their lives and their businesses and whatever else that's really powerful without becoming a narcissist without becoming a cult leader or anything like that you can still access those things in an ethical way these are just tools that we all have access to what we do with the tools if that's down to us and our own personal ethical standards yeah, well, exactly. And I think it's an important point about it's to do with our own personal ethical standards, because there's a well-known influencer at the moment, Andrew Tate. I, I think I'm, oh, I'm allowed yeah. to say his name, right? And it's very interesting to see what's kind of happening there. I mean, as one of the biggest influencers in the world, I don't know whether I can say it, but, you know, I definitely feel as though he is not a force for the good. Let's just say I don't feel as though he's been a a good influence generally, particularly on young men. And I think a lot of women feel the same. Right. But the thing is, I think the medium, let's just say, of podcasting, because we are talking about podcasting, is Mm. something that it it basically gives good people and bad people a platform as any media does and it always has done i mean you look at you know some of the some of the hitler propaganda and Mm. it, it is absolutely spectacular in terms of its use of visual imagery i mean he was very very evil so i think you know people hopefully they're getting to understand that look you know this can be this exposure can be for the good and it can be for the bad. But ultimately, yeah. we have to be able to make up our minds and be free to do that, don't we, to back whoever yeah, we I choose. I agree. And, and my hope was that people would actually take that as a call to action of yeah. saying, yeah, there are people out there who are using various platforms and tools, whatever, yeah. for not such good stuff. They might, they might think it is, they might have the best of intentions, but then again, a lot of them don't and they clearly don't. And they know, and they know exactly what they're doing. So, all the more important for your voice to be out there. All the more important yeah, for you to definitely. be a voice for 
for good and for empowerment and for making things better. And so even if there's stuff that is standing in the way of you getting your voice out there, like you're a bit shy, you're nervous, you don't know what people will think of you, you're worried about making mistakes, you have to overcome all of that because it's not about you. It's about yeah. them. And, and so if, you're, if your purpose, if your mission is about them and it isn't just about you, that's a pretty good sign that you're coming from a good place. But it is really that rallying call that you should be hearing of like, I have to overcome, I just have to ignore that stuff and put myself out, out of the picture here and just say, this is about them. I can make a difference. I have a voice and a, an opportunity for good and I need to be out there using it. Definitely. Well, John, it has been such a fantastic chat that we've had today and thank you so much for joining us on the podcast um, so if anybody wants to get in touch with you how can they go about that well if you want to sort of message me and chat with me linkedin is where i tend to hang out the most okay so you, can, you can find me there but it, generally i recommend checking out the podcast the podfluence podcast and if you really want to message me directly or find out what i'm more about go to presentinfluence.com and, and you'll see you'll see all the good stuff there yeah. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you very much again, John, and uh, wishing you every success and look forward to tuning in to some episodes of your podcast as well. Thanks, Jane. Bye for now. Thanks for listening in. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe to rate and review my podcast as it will help me bring the power of connection to the world. I work one-to-one -to, -one to help entrepreneurs ignite the power of authentic connection in their businesses and lives. I also help them accelerate their results through attracting and converting more of their ideal clients. And if this is something you'd like to do too, why not head on over to www.idealclientsuccess.com slash masterclass and I'll show you how.